also Niebuhr warns it does not mean it is the best method in evangelism Niebuhr also says it has a tendency to make Christ in its own image it has produced many fanciful lives of Jesus also I would say this view has a tendency to put the intellectual above the transcendent it is far far too confident of itself and in human achievement the following statement is an example of overconfidence which two world wars have smashed so that such liberalism should be a little more humble today quote liberal Protestantism is thus uh, as its name implies a religion of spiritual freedom it rose and has grown with liberalism and tolerance those exquisite flowers of high mental culture efflorescence of the human soul the harbingers of spiritual progress wherever they flourish uh, that wasn't a good quote that I was meant to show it was a show it show it in a bad light yeah um, basically um, um, often this idea of culture trying to mix in uh, Christianity mixing in with culture has often led uh, liberal Protestantism to, to create a God in its own image really mm. rather than actually create a God of the scripture or, or teach a God of the scripture yeah so it's open for discussion I don't necessarily agree with everything I've said it's just it's just to stimulate thought so yeah well I was just when you were talking about the, the Christ of culture there Jay yeah yeah I just I, it just seemed to me that's what contemporary Christianity is today yeah yeah it's so trying to be like the world to reach the world yeah yeah um, you know if you ask if you ask a lot of people um, in churches that are trying to reach reach the lost and that yeah you know a, a lot of the big churches now they have like uh, they might have rap music or big screens to get people in the church and what this says you know with we're trying to make Jesus relevant. Yeah. And you can un you can understand that in one sense, but you know the reality is Jesus is relevant whether people realise it or not. Yeah, yeah. We don't make Jesus relevant. He is he is relevant. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's crazy. And um, and this is why you sometimes you get these watered down, seeker friendly Yeah, yeah. Messages and that. Yeah. I think one preacher said this he says we've got to use seeker friendly methods to reach the lost but not seeker friendly messages <laughs> so by, by the method he meant you know it, it's all right if you want to be the, the Christ of culture it, it's all right um, you know having big screens in the church and stuff like that and yeah yeah and, and using media and communication yeah. In a way that the younger generation understand, but the the message of Christ has to be the same. Yeah, yeah. Now what are the message down? That's brilliant. Yeah. All right, fourth section. Uh, Christ above culture. This view sees that obedience to Christ is vital, but it must be in in the natural order. It sees culture as important as it can help humanity. For example, education. Christians of this view see grace as primary, but works of obedience are also important. This view sees the visible order as a place to express God's grace. One famous person who held to this view was the great Thomas Aquinas. He believed that the church had the role of guarding culture. Reason was also important for Aquinas here. For him, reason was the method which ruled culture. Joseph Butler, the 17th century Anglican bishop, was another famous Christian who held to this view. One of the good things about this view is that, it, is that it does lead to help humanity practically. If you see that culture has good things to offer, then the church can use culture to, to benefit society. This can be seen as I looked at Father Damien's ministry. He was a Catholic priest sent to Hawaii in May 1864 to reach and minister to the leper colony. He found that the authorities had left the lepers to do as they wish, which means these poor folk were living as dogs. Father Damien soon got to work. He built a water system so the lepers could have fresh water. 
He also read medical books and used the knowledge to help the lepers. In short, he used many aspects of culture to make the lepers live much better. Here are some more examples of what can be achieved with this Christ above culture. Quote, he decorated it so that it would be cheerful and appeal to the congregation. This was something of a shock to Europeans. One of the Franciscan sisters, who later joined Damien on Moke Island, said it looked like a, a Chinese shop, the church. He also made the Mass as ceremonial as possible. He wanted everyone to feel involved and uplifted. uplifted. He formed various associations, choirs, uh, which became quite famous, and an orchestra. The orchestra played very well, despite the fact that the musicians had fought for the most part only two or three fingers, and their lips were very much swollen. These are the leopard. This is the leopard colony that he got to to do these things, choirs and stuff like that. End of quote. One of the difficulties of this Christ above culture is that it can some that it can come across as morally superior. If we as Christians don't do practical things in the world, but instead pronounce to the world that one would, that one could be guilty of being a spiritual snob, also it can it can come across as if the church is somehow perfect without fault. I have found this to be with Newman. He regards the church as somehow a perfect beacon to the world, and the world as a mass of rubbish needing to be cleaned up. If he gets that sometimes it is the world who guides the church in the right path. Was it a Christian who brought freedom to woman or the feminist? Here's an example of Newman's approach which I don't accept. Quote, in these later days are like ma in like manner outside the Catholic Church things are tending with far greater rapidity than in that old time from the circumstances of the age to atheism in one shape or another. Lovers of their country and of their race, religious men, external to the Catholic Church, have attended various expedients to arrest fear, fierce, willful human nature in its onward course and to bring it into subjection. End of quote. I don't agree with what I've said, like, but <laughs> just some thoughts. Yeah. I was just thinking there about Christ above culture. I think it was true what he said about there's a danger like you know like snobbery yeah where you get to the point where you think you can't learn from unbelievers yeah yeah I mean I was like that years ago I thought you know I'm in the light there in the dark you know I can't learn nothing from them and you know God does teach you yeah yeah and God teaches you through the atheists you know yourself and yeah and stuff like that he teaches you um, but I think the world has Sorry, I think the church yeah. has followed the world more than it claims. I remember that scripture series by John McCann, The Sufficiency of Scripture, yeah. where he talks about all the, all the fads that come into secular culture. Yeah. And he said, he, he says, the uh, when the world gives up on them, the church takes over. And he talked about it, it, it's, the church jumps on the bandwagon just at the time it's slowing down. <laughs> which is when the world you know finds these new ideas and psychologies and philosophies yeah it writes them off and then what the church is is it picks them up <laughs> yeah. so so when something novel comes into the world yeah the church is the, is the first to start condemning it yeah well then it sort of embraces it's like when the Beatles came on the scene in the 60s you know the church in America went crazy yeah, and um, John Lennon made a quote. He said, "You know, the Beatles are more popular than Jesus." Yeah, yeah. And he wasn't like being blasphemous. He was just he was stating the fact that people seemed more interested. The church was so irrelevant. Yeah, that people were more interested in the Beatles and what the Beatles had to say about things. And then, well, that's what happened. They spoke out against, and they said the new. You know the music's all of the devil, and they all burn the oldest records and all, of, and the Bob Dylan records. Yeah. And what we're doing is, twenty years later, they're they're actually Bring turning it. the Beatles songs into Christian songs, and the church is full of it now. Yeah, yeah. So the church are like rock and roll arenas. Yeah, yeah. You know, people don't even, now. It's a it's a gross sin if a church has an organ. 
you sing it all here, it's like the worst sin ever. <laughs> it's true, mate. <laughs> that's, that's because it's given to the culture. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome, mate. All right. That was brilliant. Christ in culture, in paradox. I think this is... Uh, and then we got one more, and then that's then a conclusion. Uh, this view advocates this is Christ in culture in paradox. This view advocates a loyalty to Christ and feels a responsibility to culture. It also sees a conflict between man's righteousness and God's righteousness. In this view, grace is seen as the main source of control in a person's life. This view also sees culture as needing grace as it is affected by sin. This view is dualistic. It sees culture as damaged and going astray. It uses law to keep culture on track. The Apostle Paul might advocate this view. He regarded God as absolute and culture as relative, Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, we see also Paul's view that culture is subject to God's redemptive purposes. Martian was one of the great followers and expander of this view. He believed God created matter, but it was damaged. Scholars such as Harnack believe Marnack was a Paulinist. Martian had a high view of revelation of God's goodness and mercy, but did not like the Old Testament view of God's wrath. He also could not accept the injustice mankind had to endure in this world. He saw people as stupid, bad, and even vermin. Marcion just could not accept that a good God could create such a world. At the end of the day, the world was a tragic mistake. So what was Marcion's solution? First, Marcion taught that humanity was led by two gods, a just God who was limited even though he, was, he created the world, and then there was the good God who, through Christ, would rescue mankind out of matter. Marcion's ethics were interesting. He believed in an ethic of justice and love, but he saw them as bound up with corruption. Marcion's agenda was to draw Christians into a physical Christianity, a sort of gathered community. This view, um, this experience is shared by many Christians in that of being pulled by God and the world in different directions. Many Christians feel, can feel this in, in attention. Surely to ignore it is to bring spiritual damage to people who need some encouragement. Also, to ignore this inattention is to ignore the tremendous spiritual power the world does have on our journey with God. The problem with this view are twofold. One is the view uh, is its view that all humanities achieve in terms. Sorry, this problem with with this view might be twofold. One is that all you human all that humans achieve in terms of moral law is simply sinful, least to people ignoring those laws. This is Niebuhr's thought. I can't see it myself, but it might be a possibility. I think a better objection, as it can give Christians, Christians an inferiority complex. What I mean is, although this view has a sense of responsibility to culture, with its inherent view of tension in the world, it feels a need to be apologetic about its achievements. One has found this in evangelical scholarship. For over a hundred of years, evangelicals have felt that they had to apologize for their scholarly achievements. But whoever we are, we should be proud of what we achieve in Christ. Quote, there is a need for evangelicalism to take time to set out its own ideas without feeling the need to keep looking over its collective shoulder. Being placed on the defensive forces evangel evangelicalism into a reactive posture. In this volume, I have decided not to adopt such a position. Instead, I propose to set out the coherence of the evangelical vision of theology and engage critically with its contemporary revival rivals. End of quote. Uh, McGrath, page 21. Any thoughts? So it's uh, Christ in culture in paradox, um, a kind of tension that we're in the world, but we're not of the world, and stuff I don't know any thoughts yeah. well I was just thinking about th t terms have changed so much now Jay yeah yeah it's hard to even define what an evangelical is anymore yeah yeah I mean 50 years ago there was probably 
a definition of what an evangelical was, and everybody agreed with it. Yeah, yeah. Now, there's probably so many different definitions of what an evangelical is. Yeah. So you know. Um, do you think? Do you think? Basically, there's a theological fracture where it's become the words become nebulous. Doesn't really mean anything anymore. I do, yeah. I do. Well, people are using the term post evangelical now, aren't they? Well, what does that what does that mean? I'm not really sure. Um but they, but it's interesting though if they're using the word post evangelical. Sure, like you said, years ago when the word evangelical was being used, like in the fifties, there was a. It was very clear, even if you were in the Lloyd Jones camp or the John Stock camp or the Billy Graham camp, everybody knew wh where you were at. Um, but like today, like you said, uh, um. It's more like tribes now, isn't it? There are different tribes, and a lot of the tribes, it's very nebulous, and you don't know where they're at theologically, what they mean by evangelical. And those who do define evangelicalism <coughs> are defining it in such a rigid way, i.e. the reformed Calvinistic. Yeah. You know, so... So how does one... Maintain one's uh, your uh, theological identity. Um, uh, and live with that tension in the world. I, I, I um, there's a there's a church not far away. It's a very well known church in in Arpahe, and uh, it's an Anglican church. Uh, yeah. About, 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, it had loads of activities. It had a choir, drama group, woman's group, everything. And this mm. evangelical minister came and he closed everything down. He just, well, closed, right. he just closed everything and said, no, we're just having the preaching of the word and the prayer meeting. Yeah. And people went mad and they had... Um, they, they they had to preach in the preaching the prayer meeting and the the church grew and it was blessed. Yeah. But I've heard stories of other people at that time who were who were like like that who became bitter and twisted because they were fighting the world and they were they were um, you know they were trying to bring in the gospel and and change the church and change the area but they were always in tension with the world so. Yeah. I don't know. Can I just read this to you, Jay? Yeah. It's Bishop Ryle. He answers the question, what evangelical religion is? Yeah. So he say, he defines evangelicalism as this. He says, the simple answer I can give is to point out what appear to be its leading features. These I consider to be five in number. So he defines eval evangelical religion as one. The first leading feature in evangelical religion is the absolute supremacy it assigns to Holy Scripture as the only rule of faith and practice, the only test of truth, the only judge of controversy. Its theory is that man is required to believe nothing as necessary to salvation which is not read in God's written word or can be proved thereby. It totally denies that there is any other guide for man's soul, co-equal or coordinate with the Bible. It refuses to listen to such arguments as the church says so, the father says so, primitive antiquity says so, Catholic tradition says so, the council says so, the ancient liturgy says so, the prayer book says so. The universal conscience of mankind says so. Unless it can be shown that what is said is in harmony with the scripture, the supreme authority of the Bible 
in one word is one of the cornerstones of our system. Shows anything plainly written in that book and however trying to flesh and blood we will receive it, believe it and submit to it. Show anything as religion which is contrary to that book. We will not hear it at any price. It may come before us endorsed by fathers, schoolmen and Catholic writers. It may be commended by reason, philosophy, science and the inner light. The universal conscience of mankind, it signifies nothing. Give us rather a few plain texts. If the thing is not in the Bible or in manifest harmony with the Bible, we will have none of it. Like the forbidden fruit, we dare not touch it lest we die. Our faith can find no resting place except in the Bible or in Bible arguments. Here is rock, all else is sand. So that's the first thing he says. Wow, that's awesome. He says, the, sec he says the second leading feature in evangelical religion is the depth and prominence it assigns to the doctrine of human sinfulness and corruption. And then he goes on, he says, the third leading feature of evangelical religion is the paramount importance it attaches to the work and office of our Lord Jesus Christ yeah. and to the nature of the salvation which he has wrought out for man. Yeah. So that's the third. He says, the fourth leading feature in evangelical religion is the high place which it assigns to the inward work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of man. And he says the fifth and last leading feature in evangelical religion is the importance which it attaches to the outward and visible work of the Holy Ghost in the life of man. Yeah. I was just thinking, you know, if you, you'll get people who come along today at the post evangelicals Oh. Who maybe who were for gay marriage, yeah. but would say they agree with those five categories there, oh. but they couldn't do good there because no. they'd be they'd be breaking the first one, wouldn't <laughs> they? Which is the um, yeah, I know it's amazing, mate. Yeah, the the, the absolute supremacy of science holy scripture. Yeah, they actually think Alistair McGrath. He defines evangelicalism. I've got it written in my diary somewhere. And I think he's he think he's got that off him because he, he he puts yeah 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 he, he actually funny enough he, he he adds the church to it as well yeah six one you know fellowship within the church wow. where he's that means he's going ecumenical doesn't it yeah yeah whether he doesn't That's so brilliant. all right I'll. I've got two two more bits that shouldn't be long now. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, this is the last one, last the last model, I think. Okay, it's uh, Christ, the transformer of culture. This view is conversionist, but similar to the Jewish position. This view does not reject institutions. It does believe humanity is under judgment, but still it seeks to work in culture. Here the creation theme is important. It neither overpowers or is mastered by the atonement theme. This view sees the work of the incarnation as just as important as the work of the cross. It also sees man's state as corrupted but not bad. It believes that Jesus can transform culture. It sees the flesh as not evil. The Gospel of John teaches all this, for example, in John 3.16, uh, the universal love of God. Augustine says Niebuhr is an example of this view of Christ, the transformer of culture. For example, he used language to propagate the gospel. Uh, Niebuhr explains more, quote, Christ is the transformer of culture for Augustine in the sense that he directs, reinvigorates and regenerates the life of man expressed in all human works, which in present actuality and corrupted exercise of a fundamentally good nature which moreover in its depravity lies under the curse of transiency and death, not because it is intrinsically self-contradictory." That was a mouthful. The other great theologian who comes 
in this dream is F. D. Morris. He believed Christ comes into the world as king. He also thought Jesus was Lord of not just the church but all mankind. Even if men believed this or not, it was still true. Morris also felt that humanity was a social organism. He believed that the individualistic piety of the day failed to take into is into into sorry. Um, he believed that individualistic piety of the day failed to take this into account. Because of this, Morris thought that it was only in community that a person can truly find oneself. Finally, Morris believed in universal salvation. This view has some interesting points. With such a positive understanding of creation, it encourages people to use their talents and celebrate life. It means a painter or a musician should not feel guilty if that person wishes to express themselves and explore the world around them. This view also helps the church to realize not only is the soul important, but the whole human body, the whole man needs healing. If people realize this, it can lead to a more creative forms of ministry. For example, counseling um, for, for ministers who want to use it. <laughs> One church in Japan has already been doing this type of ministry. Quote, before long, Navo knew he must train more Christian counselors or else he would be completely swamped with people wanting to tension. So the, so, the totaling, so the total counseling school was officially launched in 1986, with Mrs. Yuko Wantabe eventually taking charge of the nationwide series of counselors training seminars. Nabavo had a compassion for the many Christians throughout Japan who were indeed saved but were still hurting because of unresolved inner conflicts complexities and fears. He now conducts counseling training seminars in 12 cities throughout Japan. Currently during one year about 2,000 Christians and non-Christians are enrolled for their seminars on four levels, learning to accept themselves and finding emotional healing." End of quote. Some problems arise with this view. First it seems to lack a doctrine of the church. It talks a lot about how Christ can transform culture, but it fails to show how this is achieved in practice. Even though Morris expresses the point that it's only a social unit that the individual can find him herself, he is not clear how this social organism is to help the situation. I think what is needed here is for his view to realize that Christ cannot transform transform culture unless he does it unless he does it through the church. That means the church has not the ability herself but needs a greater power to help, and that is Christ. This view cannot achieve its dreams unless it deals with bar 